Hi everyone, welcome back for another session of UNESCO Talks. My name is Gabby Menezes and I'm the Chief of Digital Channels here at UNESCO. And uh, this should be streaming live. Please be sure to leave comments, any questions. We will get back to you as soon as we can. Um, today our guest is Professor James Heckman, who is a Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago, as well as a Nobel Laureate of economics. His research touches on neuroscience and early childhood development, and we're really interested to know what this means for policymakers, for best practices in education and childhood development. Professor Heckman, thank you so much for being here with us. So the first question is just about your research. It touches on neuroscience, education and economics. Um, can you tell us a bit about the highlights and your most important findings? Well, my interest in this subject became, it was by accident actually, I happened to hear a lecture by a neuroscientist named Harry Chirgani who was at the Wayne State University as a neuroscience. And uh, he talked about the importance, this was like in the late 90s, early 2000s, I think it was late 90s, and he was talking about the importance of uh, early environments on child brain development. And he showed some very striking slides that he had taken and were from the literature. And I got deeply interested in this and how the brain was formed by the environment. And so ever since then, I've been working very actively in this area, borrowing insights from neuroscience, but not necessarily doing neuroscience myself. I'm not a neuroscientist. But I think the work on neuroscience is very important. It does show how the brain is developing. And it does also show how stimulation and environment, in particular aspects of the environment, stimulating, motivating the child and so forth, affects the development of circuits in the brain, literally what we think of as reasoning uh, uh, patterns and the, the ways that children think of white matter and the way that the gray matter is formed as well. This provides a very concrete manifestation of what is normally taught as just learning in an abstract way. So the fact that there's a physiological counterpart to the actual uh, practice of teaching and intervention is to me extremely exciting and really understanding that is, is very important. So what are the key findings and how they relate to education and how can we improve education policy when we're looking at early childhood development? Well, I think what's the big finding, of course, is that the early years play a very powerful role. The early years play an extremely powerful role in the sense of shaping the brain. People want to argue that most of the brain is formed by you know, five years of age. That's true, and yet it's not true, because the brain keeps transforming, even into the late 80s. So there's a very, very uh, long uh, gestation period for the brain. But the fact of the matter is in the early years, the foundations are laid. And uh, we just saw some very interesting uh, studies uh, earlier today in this session. And we found that essentially then that laying those foundations makes it much easier for the child to learn later, to engage later, and that the child is very active at that early stage. And so it's a huge mistake, as was done in the past, to start school and to think that education and learning begins at age five or six. The real learning, a very important learning, is taking place in the home, in the schooling, in the environment. And it's that that really provides a framework, a, a benchmark for learning and creating uh, what I think is opportunity for the rest of the life. And so UNESCO's mandate is really related to education, yes. to give people a quality um, education and also access to good education opportunities. Um, how can, what do we know from your research that can help policymakers really improve education policies so children can develop um, you know, as, as early as possible? Well, one thing we know is that the years before school starts are very important and that an educational system that lacks a good early foundation is going to be an educational system that's in trouble. But a second aspect of that too is we know the parents and the environment play a very important role. And I think the traditional separation between the school and the family, the idea that parents are 
surrendering their children to the schools and so forth is just obsolete. It's simply not correct. What's happening is that the role of the parent in shaping the learning of the child, preschool and then during school, and encouraging the child and interacting with the child, those interactions are as important, if not more important, than the interactions that occur in the school. They supplement, they motivate. And we found that, many studies have found that actually when children, parents, are at, or caregivers, whoever is responsible, are actively engaged with the children, encouraging them to learn, helping them, stimulating, giving a back and forth interaction pattern, that promotes learning at a very rapid rate, both in school and out of school. The important thing, I think, for this video and for, I think, this conference is to understand that learning is not just something that takes place in a brick and mortar school. Learning takes place at the home, in the neighborhood, by imitation, by essentially engagement, by trial and error, learning by doing. And it's that individual notion of how learning occurs which needs to shape the way we think about education policy going forward. So are we also looking more at play as part of the learning program? Oh, play is part of it. Play is a very integral part of it. Play, you see, involves the notion of children creating what we use technical term counterfactual worlds, imaginary worlds. I'm the king of England. I'm the, I'm the queen of uh, Austria or whatever. The child then can imagine things, and those imaginations build, build the brain. They build a sense of opportunity, and they also create a sense of curiosity. Yes, there are these things. There are worlds out there. There are things that we can do. And so if we, we imagine these things, sometimes our imagination comes true. You notice a lot of science fiction in the past has actually become reality in terms of hard science. And I think the same thing is true with a child at a, more, at a smaller scale. And what we're doing is we're imagine, allowing the child to imagine, to try new things, to be something else, to try. Our whole lives are actually spent trying out who we already are. We never really know who we are. We keep finding out, we keep exploring it. And I think it's especially true in childhood that there's this process of exploration. We're even trying out the nature of our personalities, the way we interact with others, the way we try to solve math problems or learn how to play music or try different kinds of activity. Those are the things that are really learning activities and we typically minimize them. But play is not a small part of our learning experience. It's a very large part of it. And then when we're looking at policies that uh, have been put in place, are there any success stories about policies contributing to early childhood development? Oh, many success stories. The programs that I have been mostly interested in, at least recently, have been programs that involve home visiting programs and visiting programs where parents are given ideas about how they can interact with their children and turning the children's parents in as major allies and in, in fact major sources of learning for the child. The mother, the caregiver, whoever is in charge of the child or the group in charge of the child play a, a very powerful role. And sometimes they don't even realize their power. And turning them on to that role, giving them the sense of what their power is and enabling them to facilitate this kind of learning process and a stimulation process. And learning is not just book learning, it's learning about yourself, it's learning about others, it's learning how to interact with other people, it's learning how to try new things, and maybe learning how to fail and pick yourself up again and go forward. Those are very valuable lessons, and I think that is what we learn from these studies. These studies show these home visiting programs do encourage that activity on the part of parents and caregivers, and it leads to lifetime consequences that are positive. We can follow these children, in some cases up to now age 55, 50 years after the program, and we find, what do we find? We find that the children who are in these programs directly benefit, but not only do those children benefit, their children's children benefit as well. So what we see is an intergenerational multiplier, and it's more than just the child. It's the other siblings in the same family that would also benefit. So that by engaging the family, getting the family active in the learning process, we really activate, we provide a whole new avenue which supplement what schools do 
and which strengthen what schools do. So really it's a combination of helping families, um, educating families, as well as um, putting policies in place. Enabling families and bring, getting them on board and recognizing themselves, their own power. You know, frequently people will say, okay, education starts at six years of age or five years of age. Not recognizing that all this process of providing examples, interacting with the child, you know, imitating, uh, the parents are being imitated all the time. They're setting an example. They're also challenging the child. They're responding to the child. They're showing the child love and attachment and allowing the child to experiment and fail. Those kinds of activities are fundamental to the learning activity and we've come to learn that in a way that I don't think we knew 20 years ago. So if you had any kind of advice to policymakers about interventions that, that they could create, if you could just pick one, what would that well, be? Well, I keep emphasizing the family, but I would say interventions that recognize several things. One would be an intervention with the family. But the intervention with the family, it's not a question of just giving the family money. That's been one of the big fallacies. People talk a lot about early childhood or childhood programs in the sense of providing more cash to the family. That might work. It's not as efficient as actually enabling the parent to become more effective. And by that, I don't mean preaching to the parent. I mean engaging the parent, showing the parent how the parent can help stimulate the child and interact with the child and then inform the parent about how valuable that interaction is for the child's development. So that one activity of engaging the family in the life of the child and in the learning life of the child, that would be, to my mind, the most important thing to do. Thank you so much, Professor Heckman, for joining us today. Your research is fascinating. And thank you to the audience for joining us. Um, and please be sure to tune in for the next UNESCO Talks. And just be sure to follow us on all of our social media channels. Bye-bye.